Uh, first of all, I'm extremely happy to present today here. Uh, and before we start, I just wanted to thank organizers for putting everything together to make this event happen. And big, big thanks, of course, to everyone who voted, not just for my session, but also for the other great topics and speakers. So today I want to talk about uh, Power BI internals and some best practices to keep your data model size in uh, optimal condition. I believe it's quite important topic from many perspectives. Uh, therefore, I really hope that you will enjoy the session and get some useful takeaway, takeaways once we are done. Before we start, let me just briefly introduce myself. Alexander did uh, a nice job, but he just uh, switched one thing. So I'm not in Germany, I'm in Austria. So Austrians will be offended if you tell them that, that they're in Germany, but <laughs> never mind. Uh, so uh, I'm originally from Belgrade in Serbia, but since last four years, I uh, live in a really wonderful city of Salzburg in Austria, where, where I work as a business intelligence developer at company ITSP Services. And living in Salzburg was the reason why I've chosen my nickname, uh, Data Mozart, as Salzburg is widely known uh, as birthplace of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. I was brave enough to use his last name as part of my nickname. And that's why my motto is make music from your data. Uh, I'm regularly blogging at data-mozart.com. I'm also pretty active on LinkedIn and Twitter. So feel free to ping me or connect if you like. Uh, a few more sentences about me. I have multiple year experience with working with different data products, predominantly with Microsoft data platform. Uh, started with SQL Server, then brushed myself uh, with the analysis services, multidimensional reporting services and integration services. And most recently, if you consider the last three and a half years as recent uh, with Power BI. And I'm real, really a big fan of Power BI. Uh, I'm also a Microsoft certified trainer and certified data analyst. Uh, privately, I'm a father of two little kids and through football and Barca fun. And you, as you can conclude, looking at the photo on your screen. Okay, so what should you expect today from this session? Uh, well, I like movies and especially documentary movies, uh, and I like to tell the stories. So you should not expect a normal session today. I want to tell you a kind of story. So a story about a wonderful tool uh, called Power BI. And in this, my, in this story, in my story, uh, you will be a real hero. And our villain is the uh, non-optimal data model size. As in most stories, heroes win in the end. So you will see how to overcome challenges brought to you but by evil data model and resolve different issues along the road. So finally, your Power BI development uh, will look like a real fairy tale. So make yourself comfortable, take a seat, grab a coffee or some other refreshment and listen carefully to my story. Uh, I guess you all know the story about Titanic. If you don't know, you should watch the movie with Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet. What? Ah, you already watched it. Sure, who hasn't? So Titanic was the most powerful, most beautiful, largest ship of all the time. And people were in awe looking at this brilliant piece of humans, creativity and ingenuity. But Titanic's story ended almost before it started. So after only four days of voyage from Southampton to New York City. In the early hours uh, uh, before the dawn on op April 15, 1912, Titanic uh, hardly hit one of the many icebergs in the Atlantic Ocean. At first look, it didn't seem like something that can transform the greatest engineering achievement into historical tragedy uh, when more than 1,500 people lost their lives. However, Titanic didn't sink because it hit the tip of an iceberg. Uh, the main culprit was under the surface uh, in the cold ocean water, where the largest part of this iceberg uh, resided. Uh, Titanic received the shot without a chance to recover. So, and in less than three hours uh, later, it was on its way to the ocean's bottom and place in many books and movies as well. Now you're probably asking yourself uh, what on earth story of Titanic has with Power BI. I mean, Celine Dion definitely didn't mean on Power BI when she sang, my heart will go on and on. But stay with me. Uh, if we think a little deeper, we can think of Power BI as an iceberg in the cold ocean's waters. Tip of an iceberg is your Power BI dashboard or the report itself. Uh, 
doesn't that look beautiful on this picture? So like a snowy mountain straight in the middle of the water and under this awesome blue sky. All tourists look with admiration in this piece of art of the nature. And they are making photos, videos as they want to enjoy this beauty. But what they don't know is that the real thing is under the surface. Surface. So the biggest and the strongest part of this iceberg, which provides stability and steadiness of the visible part. And this part underneath consists of multiple individual but cohesive parts, which enable above the surface parts to stand strong and shine. As I said, there are multiple individual portions down there. If you think for a moment here as a Power BI developer, you will see different concepts, architectures and techniques that makes your Power BI dashboard shine. Uh, if you don't understand and apply those concepts on the, on the, on the right side, because we have some, uh, also some on, on the left, uh, if you don't understand and apply those concepts such as data profiling, data modeling or data shaping in a proper way, uh, your Power BI report will experience the same fate as Titanic. Same applies if you don't dedicate uh, deserved attention to architectures and techniques on the left hand side. So always keep in mind that all these, but also many more concepts is what enable your Power BI dashboard to perform in the most optimal way. Therefore, never underestimate the importance of understanding all those invisible things under the surface. Uh, today, we will focus on learning and understanding Vertipack engine, uh, but you should also spend your time and uh, learn other key concepts uh, listed here. In the end, you can create Power BI reports that work without knowing these underlying concepts at all. That's true. But there is a huge difference between Power BI reports that just work and Power BI reports that work efficiently. Uh, now, in order to follow the story or watch the movie, you need to have some skills before you start. Uh, for example, uh, you can't read the book in Chinese if you don't know Chinese. Uh, so we are talking about prerequisites now. And in regard to this uh, session prerequisites, I need to stress a few things. Uh, first, this is a 300 level session, which means advanced level. So it assumes that you have some, not just basic, but intermediate knowledge and experience with Power BI and data modeling in general. That being said, I expect from you to have at least basic uh, understanding about relational databases, uh, their structure in terms of how data is being stored in the database and to be able to distinct between rows and columns. Uh, it might sound strange to, to guys who are uh, who come from SQL background, but um, it's essential to understand because of uh, because of the things we will examine later in the session. Of course, knowledge of Power BI is also necessary to follow along because I will often refer to some things related to a Power BI development that I assume you are familiar with. So as we agreed that I'm telling you a story, I mean, we didn't agree, but I hope that you're fine with that. Uh, I've intentionally avoided calling this part uh, agenda. Instead, let's think of it as a contents of, of the book. So what's in for you today? Um, we will learn what is Vertipack, uh, how it stores the data, what kind of algorithms Vertipack applies to compress the data, and how we can help Vertipack to build an optimal data model for us. Finally, we will need to leave our book on the shelf shortly, pick our toolbox, go out, get our hands dirty, and dig deep under the hood of Power BI. And during this demo, I will show you in a real-life example how I managed to reduce Power BI data model by whopping 90% just by sticking with few basic but extremely important rules that we will talk about today. Okay, here we are. Once upon a time in a far, far away land, I'm just kidding, my story doesn't start like that. So my story starts with a simple question to you. Uh, have you ever wondered what makes your Power BI report so fast and powerful when it comes to performance? So powerful that it performs complex calculations over millions or even billions of rows in a blink of an eye. So maybe you wondered, but couldn't find the proper answer. Perhaps you were just seeing the tip of an iceberg. Uh, therefore, today we will discover what is under the surface of Power BI, how your data is being stored, compressed, queried, and finally brought back to your report. Uh, once we are done, I hope that you will get a better understanding of the hard work happening in the background and appreciate uh, the, 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 the importance of creating an optimal data model in order to get the maximum performance from Power BI engine. 
Okay, going back to our starting point, uh, what is a worthy pack? Uh, again, you will need to wait for an answer. Before we come to it, we should mark the line between row store versus columnar databases. Uh, VertiPack is a columnar database. Uh, as you can see in this illustration, columnar databases uh, stores and compresses data in a whole different way comparing uh, to traditional row store databases. Columnar databases are usually implemented in large analytical systems as they are optimized for vertical, data, vertical data scanning, uh, which means that every column has its own structure and is physically separated from other columns. Another important dis distinction in order to understand what is a worthy pack is to understand the difference between formula engine and storage engine. As you can notice in this illustration taken from the book Definitive Guide to DAX uh, by Marco Russo and Alberto Ferrari, a formula engine accepts the request, processes it, generates the query plan and finally executes it. Storage engine pulls the data out of tabular model to satisfy the request issued within the query generated by the formula engine. Storage engine works in two different ways. And uh, today we will focus on this part here, so VertiPack. Uh, VertiPack keeps the snapshot of your data uh, in the memory. And this uh, data snapshot can be refreshed from time to time from original data source. Uh, frequency of this uh, refresh process depends on your business need. On the opposite, direct query doesn't store any data, so it just forwards the query straight to the data source for every single request. We will also talk about the direct query today, but without going uh, deep into details. Uh, formula Engine represents the brain of Power BI. As I already stressed, Formula Engine accepts the query, and since it's able to understand DEX, and DEX also, but it is out of the scope of today's session, uh, it translates DAX into a specific query plan, which consists of physical operations that need to be executed in order to get uh, results back. Those physical operations can be joins between multiple tables, uh, various filtering conditions or aggregations. It's important to know that uh, Formula Engine works in a single threaded way, which means that requests uh, to storage engine are being sent always sequentially. So let's reiterate once more through the whole process uh, which occurs within Formula Engine. So first step is that Formula Engine accepts the request. Then it processes th this request. Next in the line is to generate the query plan. And finally, it executes the generated query. Once the query uh, been generated and executed by the Formula Engine, then Storage Engine comes into the scene. Uh, since it physically goes through the data stored within the tabular model, which is a verti pack, or, or goes directly to a different data source like SQL Server, for example, if you use direct query storage mode, uh, we can think of storage engine as the muscles of Power BI. Uh, when it comes to specifying the storage engine for the, for the single table, there are three possible options to choose from. Uh, these three possible options are import mode, direct query mode and dual mode. We will go, uh, we will talk uh, in more details about each of those uh, uh, options uh, in one of the next slides. As opposed to formula engine that doesn't support parallelism, storage engine can work asynchronously. Uh, let's briefly introduce the import mode, which is the most common way to store data when working with Power BI. Uh, that said, import mode is based on VertiPack engine and table data is being stored in memory as a snapshot. And the key thing is this snapshot can be periodically refreshed. When you're using direct query mode, uh, data is being, being retrieved from the data source at the query time. And the key thing here is data stored, uh, data is stored uh, in its original source before, during, and after the query execution. So there is nothing stored within uh, Power BI itself. Dual mode finally represents a combination of previous two options of import mode and direct query mode. That means that uh, data from the table is being loaded into a memory, but at the query time, it can be also retrieved uh, directly from the source. Uh, as we drawn a big picture previously, let me explain now in more details uh, what VertiPack does in the background to boost performance of our Power BI reports. So when we choose import mode for our Power BI tables, 
a variety pack will perform following actions. Uh, first, it will read the data source and transform this data into a columnar structure. Then it will encode uh, and compress data within each of those columns. After that, it will establish dictionary and index for each of the columns. You will see, uh, you will learn more about dictionary and indexes uh, in one of the, of the next slides. After that, it will uh, build and prepare relationships. And finally, it will compute all calculated columns and calculated tables and compress them. So how Vertipack stores the data? Uh, as you may recall from the previous part of, uh, of our story, two main characteristics of Vertipack uh, are that it's a columnar in-memory database. Um, Vertipack applies different types of compression to each of your columns independently. That's the key thing. So choosing optimal compression uh, based on the values in that specific column. Compression is being achieved by encoding the values within the column, but just before we dive deeper into a detailed overview of different encoding techniques, just keep in mind that this architecture is not exclusively related to Power BI. Uh, in the background is basically a tab tabular model, uh, which is also under the hood of analysis services tabular and uh, Excel Power Pivot. So let's examine the encoding types which Vertipack applies uh, in order to compress the data. First one is a value encoding, then hash encoding or dictionary encoding, and finally run length encoding or RLE abbreviated. Uh, now we will go into more details regarding each of these encoding types. Uh, value encoding is the most desirable value, uh, value encoding type since it works exclusively with integers and therefore require less memory than, uh, for example, when you work with text values. How this look in reality? Uh, let's say we have a column containing a number of phone calls per day, and the value in this column varies from 4,000 to 5,000. What the Vertipack would do uh, is to find the minimum value in this column, in this range, practically, which is 4,000 in, uh, in our example, and it will set this minimum value as a starting point. Then it will go uh, through the co other column values and calculate the difference between this value and all the other values in the column and storing only this difference as a new value. You see in our example that using this uh, algorithm, we managed to, to save three bits per one row, which is not so, 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 so large. At first glance, three bits per value might not look like a significant saving. But if you multiply this by millions or even billions of rows in your table, I think you will start to, to appreciate the amount of memory saved using uh, value encoding. Hash encoding is probably the most used compression type by Vertipack. Uh, using hash encoding, Vertipack creates a dictionary of uh, distinct values within one column and afterward replaces uh, these real values with index values from the dictionary. As you may notice in uh, our illustration, Vertipack identified distinct values within the subject's column, built a dictionary by assigning indexes to those values, and finally, as a last step, stored these index values as pointers to real values. So I assume you're aware that uh, integer values require way less memory space than text. So that's the logic behind this type of data compression. Additionally, by being able to build a dictionary for any data type, Vertipack is practically data type independent. And this brings us to another key takeaway. Uh, no matter if your column is uh, of text or big integer or float data type, from Vertipack perspective, it's all the same. So it needs to create a dictionary for each of those columns, which implies that all these columns will provide exactly the same performance in terms of speed and uh, memory space allocated. Of course, by assuming that there is no big difference uh, between dictionary sizes between those columns. Th that's, that's the key uh, thing to, to remember. So it's a myth that the data type of column affects its size within the data model. It affects only dictionary size. On the opposite, the number of distinct values within the column, which is known as a cardinality, uh, mostly influence column memory consumption, as you will see later during the demo. 
third algorithm, run length decoding, creates kind of a mapping table uh, which contains uh, ranges of repeating values and that way avoiding to store every single repeated value separately. Again, when we take a look at example, uh, you will better understand how this works. Uh, true to be said, in real life, Vertipack will not store this column. I put it here just for the sake of clarity. So this column doesn't exist in reality. Vertipack stores only uh, this column, which contains number of uh, repeating values for every single value. And uh, yeah, because uh, Vertipack is uh, powerful enough to, uh, to calculate where the next node begins just by simply summing all the previous values. Uh, as powerful as it might look at first glance, uh, run length decoding algorithm uh, has some uh, limitations and it's highly dependent on the ordering within the column. So if your data is stored, like in our example here, so we have one bucket here with many repeating values, then another bucket starts after that with, again with repeating values and another one. In those scenarios, uh, run length decoding will perform great. Uh, however, if your data buckets are smaller or rotate more frequently, then run length decoding would not be an optimal solution. And one more thing to keep in mind regarding run length decoding, it always uh, occurs after hash encoding. So uh, in reality, Vertipack uh, will first perform hash encoding and create a dictionary of uh, subjects, and then it will apply run length decoding on top of it so the final logic in its, of course, most simplified way would be something like in this illustration you see on your screens. So run length encoding occurs after hash encoding in those scenarios when Vertipack thinks that it makes sense to additionally compress data. So when data is ordered in that way that run length encoding would achieve better compression than, uh, than using hash, hash algorithm solely. Uh, okay, so let me just briefly iterate through the process of data compression for a specific column. Uh, Vertipack first scans a sample of rows from the column, and if the column data type is not an integer, it will look no further and it will use hash encoding. On the other hand, if the column is of integer data type, uh, some additional parameters are being evaluated. Uh, if the numbers in uh, this sample linearly increase, Vertipack assumes that uh, this is probably a primary key column and it will choose value encoding. On the other hand, when evaluating value range uh, within the column, if the numbers in the column are reasonably close to each other, so number range is not very wide, like in our example uh, with phone calls uh, with four to 5,000 uh, uh, values uh, within the column, Vertipack will use value encoding. On the other hand, when values fluctuate significantly within this, uh, within this range, for example, between 1000 and 1 million, then value encoding doesn't make sense and Vertipack will apply the hash algorithm. However, this is important. Uh, no matter how smart Vertipack is, it can also make some uh, bad decisions uh, based on incorrect assumptions. Therefore, sometimes it can happen that Vertipack uh, makes a decision about which algorithm to use based on the sample data, but then some outlier pops up and uh, it needs to uh, re-encode the column from scratch. So let's use our previous example again uh, with phone calls and let's say that Vertipack scans uh, the sample and chooses to apply value encoding. Then after processing 10 million rows, all of a sudden it found 500,000 value. It can be an error or whatever. Now Vertipack will need to reevaluate the choice and it can decide to re-encode uh, the whole column uh, using the hash algorithm instead. Uh, obviously that would impact the whole process uh, in terms of time needed for reprocessing. Uh, here is the list of parameters in order of their importance that Vertipack considers when choosing which algorithm to apply. As already mentioned, first and the most important one is cardinality or number of distinct values in the column. After that, data distribution in the column, which means that column with many repeating values can be better compressed than one containing frequently changing values. Because as you saw, uh, a run length decoding algorithm can be applied on top of, of the comp uh, compression process. Uh, then number of rows in the table, and finally column data type, uh, 
which, as I already stressed, impacts only dictionary size, not column size itself. Okay, so uh, we need to understand relationships uh, in order to be able to optimize our data models. So once the query being generated by the formula engine, uh, storage engine enters the stage and starts its physical work in order to satisfy the request. Uh, relationships play a big part in this process. Uh, they enable quick trans quicker transfer of the filter context between related tables. And the most important thing to keep in mind regarding relationships uh, is the higher cardinality of the column that makes part of the relationship, it's the, the higher cost of that relationship is, logically. Uh, when cardinality of the relationship exceeds 1 million, users can notice lower performance in the report. So if you identify relationships within your data model that have cardinality above this threshold, maybe you should start thinking of possible ways to, to optimize this. One of the reasonable solutions could be creating uh, pre-aggregated tables with different levels of granularity so you avoid expensive relationships at the query time. Another important thing to understand is uh, materialization. Uh, now that we know what are the roles of formula engine and storage engine within tabular model, we need to spend some time talking about the materialization. And this is a step in the query execution process typical for columnar databases. So whenever Formula Engine sends the query, uh, sends the query to Storage Engine, of course, uh, Storage Engine will physically go through the data and return an uncompressed table that contains uh, requested data. The keyword here is uncompressed. Uh, this special temporary storage is called data cache and it represents the materialization of the data that will be absorbed later by a formula engine. So it's important to know that both Vertipack and Direct Query produce these temporary data cache structures. And uh, you should be aware that there are two types of uh, materialization. Uh, late materialization occurs in those uh, situations when storage engine produces one single data cache, data cache uh, with exactly the same cardinality as produced by a DAX query. On the other hand, when storage engine generates multiple data caches or when one data cache uh, has higher cardinality than one generated by DAX query, uh, we are talking about uh, early materialization. The main advantage, of course, you, you, should, you should tend to have late materialization. The main advantage of late materialization is that formula engine gets already prepared data while with early materialization it needs to perform additional stuff uh, such as uh, joining or aggregating which implies that the end users can experience slower slower queries in some situations the key takeaway here is as i said whenever possible push most of the work workload to storage engine as that will reduce uh, materialization and consequentially formula engine would have to cope uh, with less complex tasks. Finally, we need to understand aggregations. Uh, aggregations are nothing more than reorganized versions of the source table. So you can have multiple different tables related to same original table. Uh, by pre-aggregating data on different levels of granularity, we can help storage engine to work faster and scan the data in more efficient way. Uh, applying different aggregations, we are reducing the amount of data. Uh, basically, we are reducing the number of rows and, col and or columns. So if you look at this example, uh, my row table contains 7,346 7, records for chats between July 9th, 2017 and July 10th, 2017. Now, if I pre-aggregate data and count number of chats per specific subject, my aggregated table will have only 45 rows for this same period. So if my users need to analyze that data per date uh, or, or per chat subject, having this kind of prepared table will make the storage engine's job much, much easier and it can re retrieve the data much faster, of course. Uh, one important thing to keep in mind uh, regarding aggregations they don't have any impact on optimization of the complex DAX calculations. So they are just enabling storage engine to work more efficient and reduce the time needed to execute the queries. 
Uh, one more thing to keep in mind, aggregations work only with native columns from your data model. In other words, you can't perform aggregations on calculated columns. In reality, true to be said, you don't need to apply aggregations on each fact table. Uh, aggregations make sense with Vertipack uh, only for extremely large fact tables, for example, few hundred millions or few, few billions of rows. And finally, be careful when creating aggregations as each mistake can prove costly later uh, because if not defined in proper way, aggregations uh, will produce incorrect results in the report. And moreover, having aggregations require uh, additional effort for data model maintenance uh, in the future. Okay, I believe we laid a solid theoretical background for the things that come now. Uh, it's time, as I said, to get our hands dirty and see how all of this works in reality. Uh, this demo is based on a real use case, uh, which I faced during the last year. And the problem was the, the size of PBIX file on our reporting server. File size dramatically grown since the report was uh, originally introduced and I was involved in trying to find uh, an optimal solution. Just to stress one thing before we proceed further, for this demo, I've created uh, five separate PBIX files and each of them uh, represents one single phase in the data model size optimization. So I did that and we don't, so we don't need to work on one single uh, PBIX file and wait for Power BI to apply all changes we made during the process. As you probably know, in some cases, it takes a while to reload the data model and uh, recreate data model from, from scratch. So I put, I will show you now the, the starting point. I put uh, just a simple plain card visual showing total numbers of records in our fact table in each of those files. So you can follow and see that data accuracy is not being violated by applying uh, various development steps. I slightly simplified model for our demo. Let me show you here. I hope you see well. Uh, we have fact table which contains data about chats performed by our customer support and I left just few dimension tables here. If we go to a table view and let's check my fact table has somewhere around 9.3 million rows. So 9.3 million rows, that's nothing special in terms of volume. I mean, Power BI should be able to cope with that without any problems. As I said, few additional dim dimension tables, nothing special really. Uh, the key thing is that all tables, tables uh, were imported in Power BI as it is. So without any additional optimization or transformation, just simple check table name and import mode import in Power BI. Uh, to be able to follow what is going on with our data model size, I will use Dex Studio. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, Dex Studio is a really awesome free tool created by Darren Gosbell, uh, Marco Russo and Alberto Ferrari. It has a whole bunch of very handy and useful features that I would need a separate another 60 minute session just to talk about these, these features. In any case, if you are working with Power BI on a day-to-day -day basis, you should definitely start using Dex Studio. Believe me, it will make your life much easier and it will boost your productivity. So how I'm going to, to do Dex Studio? I'm going to external tools tab. Uh, I can connect to uh, external, external tools uh, directly from Power BI desktop. And here uh, I will choose Dex Studio. Of course, as a prerequisite, I forgot to mention, as a prerequisite, you need to have Dex Studio installed on your machine. So I will click on Dex Studio and it will launch uh, this tool. Okay, before we uh, proceed, let me just briefly introduce with main uh, windows here. On the left-hand side here, so you can see all tables from your data model. And uh, one of my favorite features within Dex Studio is a VertiPack analyzer tool that will help us to see uh, the, the numbers behind our data model. Uh, VertiPack analyzer just collects data from ver various uh, dynamic management views. Uh, so you can also use uh, SQL Server Management Studio to, que to query DMVs and uh, get data about uh, your data model, but you will probably find it in much more readable and understandable 
form within VertiPack Analyzer. Uh, okay, so how I go to VertiPack Analyzer, I'm going to Advanced tab, and here you see View Metrics button. Once I click on View Metrics button, VertiPack Analyzer will connect to my data model, and I can see here a bunch of different numbers. Okay, so let me just stop for a second and explain what's here. So we have all tables from our data model. If you ask yourself, uh, which are those tables with these strange names, this local date table and bunch of weird uh, characters after that, we will come later into this, so don't worry. Uh, here we have different kind of, of metrics uh, related to our data model, such as cardinality, uh, column size, the data size, dictionary size, which kind of uh, uh, algorithm VertiPack applied. And the most important, how much space uh, in percentage our table con uh, consumes uh, comparing to whole data model. Now, these small arrows next to, to a table name. If I click on this arrow, I get all these numbers broken down per column level. So I can see uh, which columns are the most expensive in my table and how much space they occupy in the table. Here you see percentage of table. You see which encoding type, hash and value. Now you know what that means because we, we talked about that. And uh, just to stress that this column size uh, figure is the is the just simple sum of data size, dictionary size and hierarchy size. So this, these, those three values make this one. Uh, all these numbers are in bytes. I forgot to say that. So you can do the math and calculate this in megabytes or gigabytes or whatever you, you, you like. Uh, OK, so before we start optimizing our data model, I want to show you something. And I want you to remember this, this picture. Not this picture, just this number. So. This is our starting point, uh, 771 megabytes. That's the size of, of our Power BI uh, desktop file. So 771 megabytes. But I lied to you. Uh, that's not the whole truth. The truth is even worse. It's not just 771 megabytes that burns our memory. Uh, since memory consumption is being calculated, uh, taking into account not just PBIX file size, but also dictionary size of your data model, column and uh, user uh, defined hierarchies, and also relationships in your data model. Now, that being said, if I open this summary tab here in VertiPack Analyzer, I can see that the my data model size is 1.86 gigs. 1.86 gigs. That really hurts. And we haven't even interacted with our report. So, Let's start and see what we can do uh, to optimize our data model. Let's go back to tables. And of course, we will spend most time uh, focused on uh, fact chat table because it's the, the most expensive one in our data model. Here, at first glance, I see two columns. One is source ID and the other is chat ID. Very ex both very expensive columns. Chat ID is just a surrogate key from our data warehouse while source ID is a primary key column from the source system. Uh, in, in, there is no scen real scenario that you need both of these columns. Even one is questionable, but both of them never ever. So I'm going back to my Power BI desktop file and I will go to transform data and I will remove this source ID column. And let's see what happens there. So I'm going to fact chat. Source ID, remove this column, and once I hit close and apply, let's wait a few seconds for Power BI to apply those changes. Okay, it was pretty fast. Going back to DAX Studio, again, I will click on View Metrics, so we refresh the, the numbers in the background. And now when I open summary, I see that my data model size is now 1.54 gigs. Still frightening, but we get rid of 300 megabytes just by removing one column, one single column. OK, let's examine further what can be removed without taking any deeper look. And we will come later into this, I promise. So going back to fact chat table, and uh, let's sort to see uh, the most 
the, the most expensive columns. Uh, date team start, date team start UTC. Do we need both of these columns? I mean, this date team start column uh, stores uh, the date about uh, starting time of the chat in original time zone, while date team start UTC is just converted to UTC. So both with, you see the, the, the cardinality of both of those columns are almost 9 million. Uh, I will get rid of this date team start column and keep only UTC values. Later, if I need to do some calculations in the report itself, I can do that uh, in the report. So no need to bloat the data model with importing to, to exactly the same columns. And uh, most of all, both these columns go to a second level precision and they're of date, date, date time data type. So I will get rid of date team start. Uh, additionally, these two columns, uh, session referer and referer, both very expensive. Uh, I uh, checked with my users and uh, they, they, they didn't do any kind of analysis of these columns. So they don't, why should we keep them in the, in the data model? Similar thing for last edit date. It's just an information when the record was last time updated in data warehouse. My users didn't need, even know that this column exists in the data model. Chat variables, another very expensive column. Uh, which uh, stores data, some kind of JSON, JSON uh, records taken as it is from the source system. So no way that any kind of analysis should be performed uh, in the report on this raw data stored as it is. So I'm going back to my Power BI desktop again to transform data and let's get rid of those columns, completely unnecessary and unneeded columns. Going to fact chat, okay. And now I will get rid of date team start, a referer, session referer. Uh, what else is we identified last edit date? Yes. And chat variables. Oops. And chat variables. Okay. So let's remove all those columns and hit close and apply. Again, we will wait a few seconds for Power BI to apply those changes. And let's check now what happens in our data model. That's why I created different PBX files. So we don't need to wait each time for Power BI to apply all those structural changes in the background. Okay, it takes a little bit more than expected but hopefully it will bring some benefit. Okay, I'm on Power BI. Okay, while we are waiting, just wanted to, to stress that checking which columns are unnecessary and unused in your reports should always be your starting point when you're performing data model size optimization. So, you, you will see in our example and during this demo that, uh, yeah, okay, thank you, Power BI. Going back again, Tech Studio, click on View Metrics. And now if we go to Summary tab, my data model size is 660 megabytes, 660 megabytes. So we shrink two thirds of the size of our data model just by removing few unnecessary columns. As I said, that should be always your starting point when you are dealing with data model size optimization. Why is that? Let's go back to a presentation and you will understand uh, why. So let's imagine you are preparing a delicious dinner for your friends. Uh, you invited them for a tasty pizza, but before you make the dish, you have to prepare the ingredients. So what goes into a regular pizza? Pizza bread, tomato sauce, uh, ham, cheese, whatever. Maybe you need some extra ingredients for some of your guests, such as, I don't know, pineapple, corn or olives, eggs, because as a good host, you want to satisfy all your guests' needs. So the next step, you're going into the local shop to buy all you need for your perfect pizza. But while you're walking through the shelves in the shop, you see a beer. Do you need a beer for pizza? I mean, it's always it's nice to have a beer, but do you need it for pizza? Few steps more and you spot the chocolate ice cream. Mm, I like chocolate ice cream, I really do. But again, do I need it for my pizza? 
man, that would be really weird pizza with choco ice cream on it. So what is the moral of this pizza story? Uh, you should focus on those and only those things you really need. Translated to Power BI development, you should focus only on data your report users really need. Okay, you can put something extra such as pineapple on top of your pizza uh, in some circumstances when you think that it would bring additional business value to your report or dashboard. But carefully evaluate if that brings more benefit in the final outcome. For example, would you buy a whole pineapple and put it all over your big pizza if you have only one guest eating pineapple pizza and five others and that, that don't like this taste? Or should you maybe prepare smaller pizza for this one pineapple guest instead and without disrupting the, the main pizza taste? So I believe that it's always useful to keep in mind this pizza comparison when you are considering which data to put in your data model. Okay, so going back to Deck Studio, truth to be said, in our data model, there are still some columns which could be dismissed, but let's now focus on other techniques for data model optimization. Uh, as you may recall from our uh, from previous part of uh, our session, when I was talking about the uh, importance uh, of parameters that affect the model size, I mentioned that cardinality is number one. So number of distinct values within the column. And the rule of thumb is the higher cardinality of, the, of your column, so the more distinct values in it, it's harder for VertiPack to optimally compress the data, especially if you are not working with uh, integer values. There are multiple different techniques for reducing the column cardinality and the most popular one is the column splitting. I'll share with you now a few examples of using this technique. Uh, let me first show you in slides how that looks like so you get a better overview and then I will demonstrate uh, how you can achieve this by writing uh, some basic T-SQL code in uh, SQL Server Management Studio. Just one important remark here be before I show you. If you think of using calculated columns to apply data model size optimization techniques, there is no benefit at all since the original column still has to be stored in your data model at first place before your calculations uh, are being applied. Uh, basically, optimization techniques must be performed on the source side, uh, in most cases by writing a T-SQL statement or within Power Query Editor. Of course, if you are writing uh, custom T-SQL code to import data to your Power BI data model, uh, keep in mind that you should perform all necessary transformations in your T-SQL logic as the query folding would be broken if you use custom T-SQL query and afterward apply additional transformation steps uh, in Power Query Editor. Okay, so let me show you these techniques uh, for reducing cardinality. For integer columns, you can split them into two even columns using division and module operations. In our case, it would be something like this. You can see on your screens. Uh, similar technique can bring significant savings when you're dealing with decimal values. Uh, you can just simply uh, split values before and after the decimal point. That will also reduce the cardinality of original column. Similarly, you can split date time columns to date and time separately. And you are getting something like this. Now let me show you how it's being done uh, in SQL Server Management Studio. So first example, using division and module operations to reduce the cardinality. Instead of having one column with high cardinality, you're getting two separate columns, one with cardinality of one, and the other one which has also uh, cardinality of 10, but uh, instead of having seven digits, we only have three. So we save some bits per row. This is extremely important in, in large fact tables. Uh, the other technique I want to show you is uh, splitting decimal values. So using parse name uh, built in T-SQL functions, you can get something like this. So instead of a high cardinality column with decimal values, you are getting two columns with integer values with lower cardinality. And finally, when you're dealing with date and time, you can use, you can cast your date time column to, to two different columns and uh, that way you will also reduce the cardinal original cardinality. Uh, the main thing here is even if you preserve second level of granularity, the highest possible cardinality of this column would be 
86,400 since this is the, the, the number of seconds within one day. So you can't have higher cardinality than this. And you saw that in our example, uh, cardinality of date time columns was around 9 million. So that will bring significant saving. Of course, these techniques would require additional effort in the report itself and rewriting your measures to return correct results. So be careful when to use them. Uh, we will examine this in the closing part of the session. I just wanted you to be aware that these techniques exist and can bring you some, uh, some uh, significant benefits in specific scenarios. Okay, so going back to, to my Power BI desktop and uh, let's focus on, on our next problem, uh, not Power BI Desktop, sorry, Dex Studio. Let's focus on our next uh, problem. So this is optimizing this date TM start UTC column. You see that this column takes 67% of our table, 67% of our table. And there are multiple valid options to optimize this column. The first is to check with your, uh, with your users if uh, granularity higher than day level uh, do they need a higher granularity than uh, day level? So in other words, can we remove hours, uh, minutes and seconds from our data model? Uh, I was experimenting without talking to my users because in 95% of cases, you will be good to go with the uh, with day level of granularity. So I was examining what kind of savings would this solution bring? And I just removed, I will show you now, I just removed the time part of uh, my day team start UTC column. Nicola, so this is your eight minute time check. Okay, okay, sure, no problem. Thanks. So uh, I removed here, I removed time part, okay, and preserved only date level of granularity. Now, when I open this file in Dex Studio, let's see what is the size of data model. Okay, going to advanced and view metrics. And now when I open summary tab, I can see that my data model size is 213 megabytes, 213 megabytes. So it's around 15% from where we started. And that's huge saving. However, it appeared that day level grain was not fine uh, enough and my users needed to analyze figures on our level. Okay, so we can at least get rid of minutes and seconds and that would also decrease the cardinality of the column. So I removed, uh, uh, basically what I did, I just rounded chat time to a starting hour. Let me show you how this looks. So all chats that started between, let's say 30000 and 35959, I rounded to a starting hour. So to 30000. And uh, I use that query to, to get data to my Power BI desktop. And now if I open Deck Studio to see what's happened with my data model applying this technique, going to advanced view metrics, 221. So eight megabytes more than in our previous uh, case, but hey, we fulfilled the, the request of our users with just eight megabytes more. And now if I expand this fact chat table, I can see that day team start UTC has cardinality of 32,000 instead of almost 9 million. So that, that's the huge, huge saver. But one thing still bothered me. Uh, chat ID column was occupying almost one third of my table. And uh, here I was examining different solutions. This is basically, this is just a surrogate key. And uh, this column has high cardinality that matches the number of rows of the table which is quite logical as it is a unique identifier in my original table. However, this column is not used in any of the relationships in my data model. Uh, just to be clear, and I don't want you to come into some quick and incorrect conclusions, uh, we can't simply remove all those columns which has ID in their names. So IP address ID, customer ID, user ID, etc., etc. Some of them, such as IP address ID, customer ID, or user ID, uh, they are used as a foreign keys to our dimension tables. And therefore they are part of our relationships in, in our data model. But chat ID column is just a surrogate key and is not being used in any relationships or calculation. So finally, I decided to remove this column completely from my data model and let's see 
how my data model looked like finally after removing chat ID column. So going to advanced view metrics and I'll again expand summary 161 megabytes. So just recall where we started 1.86 gigs and now we are at 161 megabytes. Uh, that's astonishing. In all honesty, that's astonishing. And uh, yeah, I forgot one more thing to, to one last step to do is to disable auto daytime option uh, in your Power BI uh, desktop file. Uh, if you're not aware, if you leave uh, auto daytime option checked, it will create a hidden table for every single date field in your data model. How do you get rid of this? So you go to file, options and settings, options, and then under data load, there is this time intelligence option. So by default, it is turned on. And by default, it will it will uh, create a hidden table for every single date field in your data model. So if you have multiple date, date fields in a table of hundreds of millions or even billion of rows, your data model will be bloated with those hidden date tables. And even worse, uh, this table search for the minimum and maximum date value in your whole data model. So if it happens that you have something like December 31st, 2099 for the current records in, instead of nulls, your automatically created date tables will span, will create range uh, until that date. And even if you don't have any record in your fact table that matches the, 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 this date. Uh, working with dates and the importance of having a proper date dimension to handle all of your time intelligence calculations should be a topic for a separate session. I just wanted to give you a quick heads up uh, why you should consider this disabling uh, auto date time option for your Power BI desktop files. And here is another hand use case of Deck Studio because you can't see these hidden tables anywhere in Power BI desktop. But once you connect to, to Deck Studio, as you see, now they disappeared. There is no strange local tables with a bunch of weird characters. And uh, once again, one, uh, one last time, I will click on view metrics and we preserved additional four megabytes in our example. So we went from 1.86 gigs to 157 megs. And that, that's just wow. Uh, to conclude, I managed to reduce my data model size by almost 90% applying some simple techniques which enabled uh, the Vertipack storage engine to perform more optimal compression of data or by simply removing unnecessary columns. And as I said, this was a real use case uh, which I faced during last year. So you are just watching like documentary about my Power BI work. Maybe some of you now think, wait, Nikolai, why did you waste our time with all this blah, blah talk about Vertipack, encoding, cardinality, etc. What you just shown us is basically just removal of unnecessary columns, nothing special. And in all honesty, you are not completely, but almost completely right. In 95% in of cases, when you are performing data model size optimization, simple removal of unnecessary and, and unused columns will be enough to get your job done. And as I already mentioned, but it's never enough to, to, to repeat, re repeating this, that should be your starting point when dealing with data model size optimization. In those remaining 5% of scenarios, you would maybe need to apply some more advanced te approaches such as uh, cardinality reduction using some of these techniques that I've shown you a few minutes ago. Uh, I know uh, regarding time, a uh, few minutes more, I need a few minutes more. Uh, so to, to, to wrap up, uh, here is the list of general rules you should keep in mind when trying to reduce your data model size. Keep only those columns your users really need in the report. And just sticking with this one single rule will save you an unbelievable amount of space, I assure you. As you've just seen in our demo, sticking with this one rule helped us to make astonishing savings. Always remember pizza comparison. Uh, reduce the column cardinality whenever possible. Uh, the golden rule here is test, test, test. And if there is a significant uh, benefit from, for example, splitting one column into two, or to substitute decimal column with the two whole number columns, then do it. Uh, but also keep in mind that your measures need to be rewritten to handle those structural changes in the background in order to display correct results. So if your table is not so big or if you have to rewrite, I don't know, hundreds of measures, uh, maybe it's not worth splitting the column. As I said, it depends on your specific scenario and you should 
carefully evaluate uh, which solution makes more sense. Same as for columns, keep only those rows you need. Uh, for example, maybe you don't need to import data from the last 10 years, but only five. Uh, that will also reduce your data model size. Talk to your users, ask them what they really need before blindly put everything inside your data model. Aggregate your data whenever possible. That means fewer rows, lower cardinality, so all nice things you're aiming to achieve. If you don't need hours, minutes, or seconds level of granularity, then don't import them. Uh, aggregations in Power BI and tabular model in general are very important and wide topic, which is obviously out of scope of this session. But there are really some awesome resources on the web, and I strongly recommend uh, reading a blog series on creative aggregations uh, from Phil Simark on dex.tips. Avoid using calculated columns whenever possible, since they are not being optimally compressed. Instead, try to push all your calculations to data source, uh, like SQL database, for example, or perform them using the Power Query Editor. Use proper data types. For example, if your data granularity is on a day level, there's a, there is really no need to use date time data type for your columns. In those circumstances, plain, plain date data type will be completely fine. And finally, disable auto date time option for data loading as this will remove a bunch of automatically created date tables in the background. Okay, guys, looking forward to hearing your questions. In case they have not enough time for, for questions, or if I don't know the answer right now, I will try to collect them and get back with the answers. We do have time for questions. Um, I mean, you have a, at least 15 minutes for qu questions, but uh, people are not going to be able to talk. So you have one question in the Q&A window. Aha, let me just... Uh... And it's a good one. Something is... Uh, chat window or us? No, 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 no. Sorry, just need to... Uh, how can I access it because it's minimal? Sorry, I don't have so much experience with the uh, with the uh, ah Q and A. Okay, I find it. I found it. Uh, wooden splitting columns to reduce cardinality. I will. I will uh, read it. Uh, yeah, uh, wooden splitting columns to reduce cardinality also add to more use of processing power. As you now have more columns and our file size goes up. Our first step was to reduce column to make things go faster. Uh, it depends. Uh, as I said, splitting columns should be used in some edge cases, where, for example, uh, you are working on a pro license and your data model size is nearly one gigabyte, which is the maximum. If you don't have any other possibility, splitting columns make sense in order to, to reduce the, the size of the model. It will probably, uh, depending on the measures you have and how many measures and how complex they are, it will probably affect uh, affect uh, mm, uh, speed of uh, of calculations and pro yeah, basically processing power will increase. But it depends. So you need to 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 kind of make a trade of what, what's most more important for you. If you don't need to split column, of course, you don't, you, you will not do this. But if you are close to this, uh, to this limit of, of one gigabyte and splitting column will help you to, to uh, reduce your data model size to accept, accept, acceptable size, then you should do it. What are uh, another question? What are some best practices for making Power BI faster when my data set is not more than 200 megabytes or so? Uh, for making Power BI faster, th this can be treated in many different ways. If uh, we were talking about optimizing data model size, if your Power BI report uh, is slow, that's a whole, whole different topic. Uh, Many different uh, reasons can be uh, for that. Uh, maybe you have uh, uh, co complex, complex calculations. Maybe you have uh, too many visuals which need time to render on, on your report page. It really depends uh, without looking at, uh, at this concrete uh, case. I can't be specific enough. 
sorry if, if that doesn't answer the question. And the problem, probably another answer would be to definitely learn how to use the DAX Studio, because that, as, as you've said more than once, that is definitely going to help you in almost any cases when it comes to Power BI and tuning. Sure, sure. Tabular Editor, also another fantastic tool, but DAX Studio as a fir first, uh, first responder kit, you see what's happening in the background. Top tip right there. All right, people are quiet, which is not that common. It's nice when they're quiet sometimes. <laughs> so thank you so much for a great session. I learned a ton and I've been using this since basically it came into being. It's always amazing to, to, um, to see a new speaker that I haven't seen before, because again, I, I always pick something, something new up. So awesome. Thank you so much for, for speaking. Thanks. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks. Okay. If there are no questions at the moment, uh, yeah, before I wish you a nice rest of the day, uh, let me first give a well-deserved credit to our little community artist, uh, Nakshatra. Uh, she's a daughter from our, one of our fellow speakers, uh, Dipti Guguri, and she's a very talented young lady who always uh, surprises us with uh, masterpiece drawings. So thank you, Nakshatra, for this beautiful piece of art. And of course, I would like to thank you for attending this session and listening to, to, the, to my story. Hope that you enjoyed it and got some better understanding of what is going on behind the scenes in Power BI while being entertained at the same time. And I also hope that you will now more appreciate the hard work which Vertipack performs uh, for us in order to make uh, our Power BI reports lightning fast. Finally, I believe that watching this demo, you've got inspiration to optimize your own Power BI data models. Trust me, it's not complicated. Simply follow the rules from the, from the session summary and uh, I can guarantee you that your models would be much, much better fit for your reports. So that's all from my side. Stay safe and enjoy the rest of Group I.